um, at the, uh, on the podium here to my left are our program chairs, I'm sure uh, already very well known to, uh, to most of you. Um, at my extreme left is uh, Harold Nyman. Um, once again, I, I, um, I, I uh, urge you to read the, the biographies in the, uh, in the binder. Um, so suffice to say that, uh, that Harold, of course, is a, a, a longtime mainstay of CLE, both at the Law Society and at the Canadian Bar Association, and indeed at Osgoode Hall Law School, where he's um, been involved in the family law intensive and trial practice programs. And of course, he's also written extensively in the area of mobility rights. Um, to my immediate left, Harold's immediate right, is of course uh, Gerald Sadvari, um, a member of the certification board of the Law Society of Upper Canada in family law and the author of approximately 70 articles in family law in various journals, uh, books, um, law society and Canadian Bar Association materials. And I believe that Jerry will speak first. Please join me in welcoming our chairs and Jerry Sadvari. Thank you, Paul. Welcome. Uh, today, together with uh, a preeminent uh, faculty from all walks of uh, legal life, uh, the judiciary, academia, and uh, practice, we will be exploring the uh, elusive, and some might say uh, illusory, concept of the best interests of the child. Uh, we are uh, going to hear from uh, uh, various people very uh, serious uh, analyses of the uh, concept, its limitations, and uh, where we may take it from here. You will also find as um, a, a, uh, a contrast to that at tab two of your material, as a sort of bonus, uh, a uh, game that you can take away uh, and play at home called the custody game. And uh, that uh, is not the theme of uh, today's uh, conference, but uh, it is uh, one way of uh, looking at best interests. So since we are a little bit behind, uh, I'd like to uh, ask Harold to uh, move us right into our first speaker. Thanks, Jerry. In organizing this program uh, and trying to plan the day, we thought what better way than uh, to begin by hearing from the children themselves. Hence, uh, a video that you're about to see. The video is uh, called Children Talk About Divorce. And uh, to introduce the, uh, the video, Rhonda Friedman uh, will be joining us. Rhonda is the founding director of Families in Transition, which is a department of the Family Service Association of Toronto. Families in Transition has provided specialized services that help children adjust to parental separation, divorce, and remarriage since 1984. Rhonda, can you come up here, please? Um, I just wanted to say a few words about when we made the video and the reason that we made it. Uh, so the children, you'll see six children in this film, ranging in age from uh, six to 14 years. They volunteered to come and talk with us about the impact of parental divorce on their life. And it was filmed in March of 1988. The purpose for making the film was that it formed part of our presentation to the Special Joint Parliamentary Committee looking at child custody and access. And we hoped that it would have a life beyond that purpose, um, uh, such as events such as today. Um, the children, as I say, volunteered, and it's important to know that there are no, were no parents present during filming. In fact, all of the parents asked me how to prepare their children uh, for the film, and we told them there was absolutely no way that they could, um, except to dress them in uh, red or blue so that it didn't make the camera go crazy. Um, each of the children would film for one and a half hours. They could say anything they wanted. The film itself is 18 minutes, so they were aware that it would be edited down. Um, I interviewed the children for the film, but I don't appear in the film because it's not about me. Um, I did ask each child three questions because of the reason that we were making it. Um, and those questions were, what advice did they have for other children? What advice did they have for parents? And because I could not imagine how to explain the special joint committee to them, especially the six-year-old, I told them that the prime minister was going to change the rules for parents and did they have any um, advice for uh, him as the person in charge of parents in Canada. Um, 
The film is divided into seven sections. They were not preconceived, so what you see will be uh, what we drew from the material that the children gave us. And I'll just point out that there is a section on parent conflict because every single child in this film um, just talked about it without even being prompted, uh, and we considered it one of the most important things that they said. Um, I think that's about all I want to say, except I have been told that we have bios at the beginning on each of the children, how old they are, what grade they're in, that sort of thing. Uh, and they come up fairly quickly and people are always sorry they didn't pay more attention. So I should just point out they'll come up really fast at the beginning and you might want to really uh, pay attention at that point to who the children are. Uh, and I think that they're far more articulate than I could be about the impact of divorce on their lives. how these children's problems are dealt with in court. Uh, our next spe speaker is uh, Professor Nicholas Bella. Professor Bella has been uh, teaching law at uh, Queens for 19 years and was associate dean and is one of the uh, premier uh, academic writers in uh, the areas of family law and, and children, uh, children's law in particular in, in Canada. And Professor Bella has uh, written uh, a fantastic paper summarizing uh, and uh, exploring the concept of best interests as it has been uh, dealt with in our courts. Uh, and he uh, talks about the best interests of a child in the postmodernist era, which I, I, I hope is going to be a, a deconstructionist approach and that he'll explain that to us because I always wanted to know what it meant. So uh, Professor Bala, please. Uh, it's uh, common at Law Society Special Lectures to have um, an introductory overview, a sort of thematic overview of an area presented by an academic, a, a legal scholar. And um, those of you who've looked at the title of my paper, The Best Interest of the Child in the Postmodernist Era, a central but elusive and limited concept known now that I'm a law professor and spelling is not my forte. My spell check uh, is not what it could be. Um, and I know that... Uh, uh, Coming as an academic, there's always a danger in inviting academics to speak at these uh, conferences. Um, you probably know that the uh, was in your days as a law student that uh, an LLB student was expected to take uh, the main principles of law and, and, and weave them into a 25-page uh, paper that really covered the entire discipline of law. If you get a graduate student, that would be someone who would uh, uh, take an important idea in an area like family law and make it into a 200-page paper. If you invite a professor, you can get someone who's going to take one point and turn it into an entire academic career. <laughs> and uh, in thinking about the is issue of best interest and my role in the academic world, I, I'm not a postmodernist. Uh, it's not a concept that I fully understood, but I hear my colleagues talking about it all the time, so I thought I'd better use it before the century ends. Um, and in fact, that, that I'm using it probably indicates that it's a, a sort of a retro idea. But um, postmodernism is an idea that I'm sure you're all intuitively familiar with, and it's the idea that um, there is no such thing as objectivity, there is no such thing as neutrality, um, that position and context are everything. And this is particularly true in the area of the best interest of the child. What is often said by lawyers, know your judge is a critical decision that who is deciding what is in the best interest of the child is often determinative in, of the decision that is actually made. Um, when we think about the best interest of the child, it's an absolutely central con uh, concept. One of the interesting things as an academic is that there are really few areas of law in which there is one idea, one phrase that so fully captures um, the area and, and drives the decision making that's going on there. And we tend to focus on best interests of the child, thinking of that, well, that's what judges do. But of course, it's also what assessors, what mediators do. It's the kind of decision that lawyers often make. Lawyers, you as lawyers, decide more cases than judges through your negotiation and your view of what advising parents about what is in their best interest or the children's best interest. And indeed, parents themselves make decisions based on their assessment of what is in the best interests of the child. It is a, a concept that is powerful. Uh, it has tremendous political and symbolic appeal, but it is also, a, in many ways, a very problematic concept. 
um, inevitably deciding what is in the best interest of the child is a value-based decision. Um, and I have a few quotes early in the paper. Uh, for example, some academics uh, have said, well, the best interest standard provides no clues at all as to how it is to be satisfied. Judges could just as easily have no standard at all. And then quoting an American uh, scholar, Robert Newcomb, he says, when you're thinking about what is in the best interest of the child, deciding that poses a question that is no less ultimate than the purposes and values of life itself. It is not one that can be approached on a value-free uh, basis. When we think about uh, the best interests of the child test, uh, who is going to be applying it, whether it is uh, judges, lawyers, politicians, or parents, inevitably their values are determinative or very influential in what the best interest of the child, a particular child, means. And there have been many critiques of the best interest of the child test. One of the interesting things to me as an academic is that uh, uh, it's almost become a sort of a Rorschach test for uh, critics of, uh, of legal doctrine. Uh, some of the first critics and criticisms of the best interest of the child test came from feminist scholars who said, really, the best interest of the child test masks discrimination against women in different uh, kinds of contexts and is harmful to women. Um, and that critique really developed in the 1980s, and Susan Boyd, who we'll hear from, is one of the uh, many eminent uh, scholars who developed that. More recently, we started to find that fathers' rights groups are saying, no, the problem with the best interest of the child test is it discriminates against fathers. And it's an anti-male uh, test. And uh, it's often used against fathers. Another interesting example, uh, gays and lesbians and, and uh, scholars said, well, really, when best interest of the child decisions are being made about involving gay and lesbian parents, the best interest of the child test discriminates against gays and lesbians. And there's probably a lot of, or was a lot of force to that uh, criticism. More recently, we started to have pro-family uh, academic scholars saying the problem with the best interest of the child test is it discriminates against those who are in traditional heterosexual marriages. And that uh, really that's the problem with the best interest of the child test. So we see that this central, uh, very important uh, concept is being criticized really from all uh, angles, that it's uh, a test that is vague, and its vagueness allows judges, among others, to inf uh, use their values to determine how that test um, will be applied. Uh, one of the problems, of course, is that having a vague test makes litigation unpredictable and in some ways encourages litigation. I'll be talking more about this theme, but the idea that the existence of this test really uh, encourages often uh, either uh, exploitative threats in the uh, context of uh, possible litigation or actually going into uh, court. One of the, uh, the ironies or the paradoxes of the best interest test is that um, when uh, parents are separating, um, they don't start to really think about the best interest of their child until after the separation occurs. And at least in some marriages, I don't want to say by any means in all of them, when parents are separating, there's an argument or, or a critique that if they were thinking about the best interest of the child, they wouldn't have separated at all. That's some marriage. I don't want to say that that's true in all uh, relationships whatsoever. Another of the ironies, the tragic ironies of the best interest of the child is that in high conflict situations where the parents are coming to court and saying we want a judge to decide what is in the best interest of the child, the litigation about best interests is itself very harmful to the child despite the fact that each parent is there claiming and arguing that they are there promoting uh, the best interest um, of the child. Um, when we think of the best interest of the child, one could say, well, it's not a very good test, or how do we get here? And so in the paper, I, I trace the, uh, the history, uh, a very quick uh, history of how we make decisions about children, how over the course of uh, a legal history, views have changed. We didn't always have the best interest of the child test. It's a relatively recent um, development. Historically, um, really for almost two millennia, the rule was that the father got to make all the decisions about children. If parents separate or divorce, the father got custody. There was a virtually uh, property-like set of ideas. And it was really only in the middle of the uh, 19th century, in the 1800s, that um, the law started to change and give some recognition to the welfare of children. Um, and legislation passed in this province about 150 years ago uh, began to, at least in circumstances, Circumstances 
give uh, mothers the right to start to seek uh, custody of their uh, children in the context of parental separation. And the first cases that started to use concepts like the welfare of the child uh, were really decided just about 100 years ago. The, uh, the court started to use the, uh, the welfare of the child principle. At the same time as they were developing the welfare of the child principle, the uh, uh, discipline of psychology began to develop. And one of the, the tenets of at least early psychology was that uh, mothers were the natural caregivers uh, for uh, children. And so by the early years of the uh, 20th century, uh, the courts developed the tender years doctrine, the presumption that in the context of parental separation, uh, other things being equal, the child uh, is entitled to uh, live with the uh, mother. And in fact, the Ontario Court of Appeal uh, in 1955 and Bell and Bell said, no father, no matter how well-intentioned or how solicitous for the welfare of a child, can take the full place of the mother. Um, and goes on to say, uh, the feminine touch means so much, especially to a little girl, the frills and frounces uh, of the mother uh, are, are what give the child uh, the best care that it can get. So really we had a very strong, tender years doctrine um, that developed. And certainly as we look back at some of those cases from the uh, middle years of this century, um, we can see that there was a, both a, uh, a very strongly gendered uh, view of what would be in the welfare of children and also quite a moralistic view because if the mother committed adultery, she would be rendered unfit and uh, would not get custody uh, of her children. One of the things about that tender years doctrine, it was based on the idea, on the belief that mothers were better caregivers. So it was actually based on a notion of promotion of welfare of children. And so as people began to think more about it, they said, really, what we're saying is the welfare of the child should be the dominant uh, principle, and we shouldn't necessarily have a presumption uh, in regard to custody in favor of mothers. And so uh, at the same time as courts were saying there is a strong presumption in favor of mothers, um, they also began to say that the welfare and happiness of the infant is the paramount consideration in questions of custody, and began to more fully articulate uh, a best interest of the child philosophy. And that applied not only in disputes between mothers and fathers, but also in situations where uh, third parties, where so-called psychological uh, parents began to seek uh, custody of children. Uh, the, the best interest of the child, at least in Canada, became the dominant uh, test. Um, we didn't have legislation that recognized the best interest of the child test until we went through a period of reform. Uh, as I'm sure you know, in the 1970s and 80s, as our uh, family structure began to change, as values and, and attitudes about the role of women in the family and in the labor force began to change, we went through a dramatic period of legislative reform, uh, both in terms of property and support law, and also in regard to uh, custody and access decisions. Um, in 1978, in Ontario, the best interest of the child test was enshrined in legislation, a very short statement saying that custody and access disputes should be decided in accordance with the best interest of the child. A very short statement in the uh, Family Law Reform Act of 1978. Uh, people looked at that and said, well, that's not giving judges enough, discretion, enough direction. It gives them too much discretion. So uh, a few years later, in 1982 in Ontario, the best interest of the child test was uh, um, re-articulated in the Children's Law Reform Act. Um, and there is a, uh, in section 24, we now have a relatively long definition of best interests of the child, um, uh, which you can see in the paper and you know from the legislation, sets out a number of subparagraphs that suggest that these are factors that the judge should take into account, along with any other circumstances that the judge considers appropriate. Uh, in the Divorce Act, we have a shorter best interest of the child test, but again, one that sets out a few ideas. One of the interesting things to me is when I look at the case law, I don't see a single decision in Canada in which the definition is significant. In other words, whether you're under the Family Law Reform Act in 1978 with a very short definition, the Children's Law Reform Act with a lengthy definition, the Divorce Act of 1986 with its medium-sized uh, definition doesn't seem to matter uh, in terms of the outcome of the cases. Um, nobody seems to look very much uh, at the definition. When we're thinking about best interest of the child and you're putting it in a bit of a context, 
it's worth considering other kinds of situations which best interest, the best interest principle is used, and there are certainly other statutory uh, contexts in the uh, children's law area and the child protection legislation we have, the Child and Family Services Act, and adoption legislation. Again, there's a definition, a statutory definition of best interest of the child. Uh, child protection context and adoption context are, of course, quite different from the divorce context, which is the main focus of today's proceedings. Um, I think that it's the context that makes the difference rather than the statutory definition. When you look at the statutory definition, the Child and Family Services Act, it doesn't seem very uh, different uh, from the definition that we would see in the uh, Children's Law Reform Act. I think it's the context that, that makes the difference rather than the, the statutory definition. Interestingly, we now also see the best interest principle recognized in international documents, and in particular, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which is the United Nations Convention that was adopted and ratified by Canada. Um, that convention makes the best interest of the child a central concept. Um, and in fact, in Article 3 of the convention, it stated that in all actions concerning children, whether undertaken by public or private authorities, by courts of law or other legislative bodies, the best interests of the child shall be a primary consideration. Interestingly, Canada signed and ratified that convention, indicating the uh, intention to be bound by that convention as a matter of international law. Um, initially, many people, perhaps myself included, thought that the convention would have very little significance in Canada because it was not enacted in a, a piece of Canadian legislation. It was just a convention that Canada had signed and ratified. And the traditional view in Canadian uh, jurisprudence was that conventions that were not uh, adopted in legislation did not have uh, legal e effect for purposes of domestic law. However, in its recent uh, decision in 1989, the Supreme Court of Canada in Baker versus Canada, uh, which was an immigration case, the Supreme Court of Canada had the opportunity to reconsider the roles uh, of international treaties in domestic legislation, domestic law, and in particular the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And in that immigration case, the Supreme Court of Canada said, although there was no, in, immigra in the Immigration Act, there is no reference to the interest or the best interest of children, when an immigration officer is considering whether to make it, uh, to deport a, uh, a parent of Canadian children, or making, in that case, it was actually a humanitarian compassion consideration about whether the parent should be able to consider uh, to remain in Canada, the immigration officer was bound to consider the best interest of the child. The best interests of the child are not determinative, but the failure to even advert to the interest of the child as a factor in decision making was a violation of the convention and therefore was a violation of Canadian law. So that the Supreme Court gave central importance to the convention uh, and in that decision, Madam Justice LaRue de Bay uh, talked about the importance of recognizing and being attentive to the rights and interests of uh, children when making any kind of decision. Now, Baker was a relatively easy case for the Supreme Court to consider in that the immigration officer had completely failed to advert to the interest of the child in making a decision. And the Supreme Court was able to say, well, you should go back and weigh all of the factors, including but not limited to the interests uh, of, the, uh, of the child. Uh, one of the interesting and, and to me, disturbing um, context in which there's actually less emphasis on the interests of children um, than there uh, was in the past is in regard to children who are violating the criminal law. In this country in 1908, when the Juvenile Delinquents Act was enacted to deal with children who violate the criminal law, um, the best interest of the child or the interest of the child was recognized as a central theme for making decisions about children who violate the criminal law. Um, as we've moved into the Young Offenders Act and we have new federal legislation, the new uh, Youth Criminal Justice Act, there is increasingly less emphasis on the interests of children and more emphasis on accountability. And I find this quite disturbing, particularly when one considers that most of the children, many of the children who are being dealt with in the youth justice system are children who initially uh, were dealt with in the child welfare system or in the context of divorce when somebody made a best interest decision and it is though we're saying, well, we made a best interest decision for you, it didn't work out, 
now we're sending you into a system where your interests are not an important factor. Rather, you're going to be held accountable for your wrongs. But uh, youth justice stands out as a as a, uh, really an island where we see a decline in best interest of the child. In most contexts, uh, best interest of the child is uh, increasingly uh, important. Now, for the rest of my remarks and really the rest of today's uh, proceedings, we're going to focus on the best interest of the child uh, in the context of parental separation, either divorce or where you have uh, unmarried uh, parents. And when thinking about this kind of uh, decision making, especially from the perspective of litigation, um, this is a unique uh, litigation context. Most kinds of litigation are retrospective. The focus is what happened in the past in a criminal case. Was this the person who shot this uh, victim? Uh, it's retrospective. Best interest decision are inherently prospective. We're asking what will happen in the future. That is an inherently predictive and uncertain exercise, inevitably. One dimension of that is we know you may not, uh, the judge or other decision makers, may not make the right decision. So one characteristic of this kind of decision is it is always variable. So you can always come back to court and vary it. And I think it's important that, and everyone who looks at this area says, well, we should always be able to make variation applications. On the other hand, and I argue in the paper, um, that while it's important for there to be the possibility of variation, there are parents who inevitably are going through a bitter divorce, separation, and use the litigation process for uh, ex exacting vindication or revenge or airing feelings of anger. And allowing people to continually come back to court uh, is problematic. And I would suggest that there should be some control over people's access to the uh, judicial process. And in fact, we do have uh, provisions that allow uh, uh, parents to be penalized for coming back to court repeatedly in terms of uh, now awarding costs against uh, parents who seem to be abusing the uh, variation process or even denying access to the court through the vexatious proceedings. Um, I actually would submit there should be more of that uh, restricted access uh, to the court system in order to promote the best interests of children by limiting uh, continual parental ac access to um, the litigation process. One characteristic of best interest decision making is that um, the character of the parents, the character of the litigants is the central issue. Unlike other kinds of legal proceedings, and again, the criminal context is a good uh, counterpoint where we say character is irrelevant. In a criminal case, we say we don't want to hear about your bad character. That would prejudice decision makers. We want to focus on one or two single isolated acts. In the best interest context, we say the parent's character is central. Everything is potentially relevant. So we should get into uh, were they using drugs? Uh, what was their sex life like? Uh, was there violence? Was there uh, insulting behavior going on? Uh, what was the relationship with the in-laws? The entire lives of these people can be laid uh, down as potentially relevant. And this is particularly problematic when the parents are separating and one or both of them are in a high conflict situation and they're saying, I'm very angry or thinking I'm very angry with you. There's something I want to say and you've been a terrible spouse or parent and person and I'm going to get a judge to hear all the terrible things you've done starting from the beginning of our relationship or perhaps the beginning of your life and I think it's all relevant to the best interests of these children. Um, and it's very easy for custody and access disputes to degenerate into a mudslinging match and that's now different from really all the rest of our family law decision making. If you're talking about property or even support, we say, you know, your conduct doesn't really matter. But in custody and access cases, uh, character becomes a central issue. And I would argue that while often character and, and the entire lives of uh, the parents may in some way be uh, significant, and certainly, for example, issues of domestic violence should be uh, taken into account in decision making about children, it's also important to maintain some control over what's going to be said initially in the context of the affidavits that may be filed in court documents and then in court proceedings. And one should always ask, is this kind of highly personal, highly vindictive, uh, potentially biased uh, information actually relevant to uh, the best interests of these children? 
I would argue, first of all, that lawyers have some professional responsibility. Lawyers for parents have a responsibility uh, to ensure that uh, what they are submitting in affidavits or evidence is uh, relevant and not harmful to the best interests of the children who are involved. Um, and similarly, that judges who are controlling the uh, evidence in a court proceeding have to ask themselves, is this evidence about the parents actually relevant to the child's welfare, or is it going to be harmful, so harmful to the child, so embittering to the parents that I should exclude or discourage um, the admission of this kind of evidence? And that's a difficult uh, role for um, both lawyers and judges, but I think that those who are involved in working with the adults also have a responsibility um, to their children. I know that the Law Society is right now going through a process of revising its Code of Professional Conduct, and I've personally written to the uh, uh, committee suggesting that they uh, consider that uh, issue of the ethical obligation of uh, parents' lawyers towards children. Um, another unique uh, feature of uh, best interest litigation is the idea that because we have expanded notions of relevance, because it's future-oriented, um, the rules of evidence should be very much relaxed. And we certainly see many judgments in which judges say, well, this is a best interest decision. Uh, I'm going to admit hearsay and other kinds of evidence. Uh, or I'm going to take a unique kind of role. And the Court of Appeal has uh, very much uh, supported that and said, well, if judges want to call witnesses in a best interest decision, um, they may do that. We shouldn't follow the ordinary rules of um, civil litigation in this kind of context. Um, another dimension of best interest decision making, of course, is that the child who is at the center of this dispute uh, is not a party to this uh, litigation and the person who is most affected is not a party to this. And I should say it's interesting when we think about best interests, we have all these adults who are involved saying this is what is in your best interests. Ironically, when children themselves are involved in different kinds of litigation or, uh, or decisions are being made about them, they rarely want to invoke the best interest of the child themselves. The child will say, and I certainly see this as a parent of four children, when I say this is in your best interest, my kids say, I don't care, I want to do what I want to do, I, want, I have rights. Um, and uh, uh, someone from the children's lawyer can give me your card and I'll pass that at home tonight. Um, uh, in fact, in, a, in the paper, I talk uh, quite a bit about the role of the Office of the Children's Lawyer. Um, I'm not going to talk about it a, a great deal in my oral remarks. I know that the role of the Children's Lawyer is contentious, uh, both for judges and uh, for uh, uh, lawyers. Often people say, well, the parents are involved. They know what's in the child's best interest. The judges there are saying, I know what's in the child's best interest. I have to make that decision. Do we need this extra person there who also says, well, here I am representing not necessarily the best interest of the child, but at least the interest of the child. Um, I think in this province we're actually very fortunate to have uh, the Office of the Children's Lawyer. I think in many cases uh, the Children's Lawyer has an important role in pushing the parents to settle cases. That's an important role, reminding parents, here's something to think about in terms of the interests of your children. I think that there's also an important role of litigation is going ahead in having an independent uh, voice there for the child. And I think uh, it's significant to me um, that in this time of fiscal restraint, when all kinds of uh, government services that affect children are being dramatically cut, um, the Office of the Children's Lawyer has not had that kind of uh, budgetary cuts. And I think it's because the government recognized the value, in part probably the economic value, but also the social value uh, of this office. And I know many of you in this room do uh, work for the Children's Lawyer. I think it's an important uh, role to have. Um, and I, in the paper, I cite some cases where some judges say, well, we don't need to have the children's lawyer here. After all, if the child's input is required, the court is always at liberty to deal directly with the children if this is deemed to be necessary. In my own view, and with the greatest respect, um, I don't consider that having a judge uh, interview a child is an especially effective way of getting the child's uh, views uh, and uh, 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 wishes uh, before the court that a, a judge's interview is a particularly intimidating uh, setting for a child, and if one wants the child to communicate effectively, it's much better to have uh, either a lawyer or an assessor or social worker meet with the child and bring forward the child's views before the court in that kind of a, uh, a context. Um, thinking about the child's best interests, of course, um, one can't uh, avoid uh, recognizing that this is also a, a set of issues in which mental health professionals, assessors, psychologists, psychiatrists have a very important role. 
And I think that there is what I refer to as an ambivalent relationship between the legal system, between the judiciary and lawyers on one side and mental health professionals on the other side. And the people on the legal side of the fence uh, are saying, well, um, do you have something to bring to the process? And there's actually a, an interesting book that I cite now um, called The Scientific Basis of Child Custody Decisions. So one immediately says, oh, there is a scientific basis here. It's a fairly grandiose title. It's actually quite a good, uh, a good book. Um, it's at uh, footnote 72 if you want the, the site for it. Despite the grandiose title, it's actually a quite uh, well-balanced uh, approach by an, a number of mental health professionals who talk about the limitations and the, the values that uh, assessors and other mental health professionals can bring to the best interest decision-making process. Um, I think that uh, assessors, in a broad, generic sense, can bring a great deal to the process. Not every case requires an assessor, um, but they can gain, in a way, similar and overlapping to the children's lawyer, someone who can bring uh, a, a, some objectivity, and of course, in the postmodernist vision, nobody is fully objective, but some objectivity, some independent information to the process, often pushing the parents to settle. That's a good thing, I think, not a bad thing. Um, but, uh, or bring important information before the courts. Uh, one view that I have of the assessment process is that it's almost like the first level of decision making if you're going through the litigation process. It's someone, it's a judge-like function, not a judicial function fully, but it's someone who's going to say, I'm going to have an informal kind of investigation here, and if I think that, and I'm going to make a recommendation, and often that recommendation will determine what's going to happen. If people don't like that, they can go in front of the judge and in effect have a hearing de novo and, and challenge the assessor's view, challenge the assessor's bias, but in practice that first level of decision making uh, resolves uh, many cases. And indeed, even before the assessment process, you have the parents themselves making most uh, decisions on their own uh, without necessarily involving uh, professionals at all uh, in, that, uh, in that process. Um, there are many examples of judges, on the one hand, saying assessors are very important. And when you look at the, do, at the literature, it's clear that most cases the judge actually follows the assessor's view. There are some statements from judges saying, well, we don't need to have mental health professionals involved or they're too expensive. Um, Madam Justice LaRue DeBay um, suggested in uh, Young and Young that expert evidence should not routinely be required to establish the best interest of the child. Uh, common sense requires us to acknowledge that the person involved in day-to-day -day care the primary caregiver, may observe changes in behavior and mood that would go unnoticed by anyone else. The custodial parent normally has the best vantage point to assess the interest of the child and thus will provide the most reliable and complete source of information to the judge about the needs and interests of that, that child. Now, with the greatest of respect, that is a, uh, it is true that in general parents know a lot about their children, but when you're involved in litigation, uh, I would suggest that often uh, the custodial or the non-custodial parent uh, have their own views and biases th and that an assessor will often provide a more objective view. And indeed, in later decisions, Madam Justice Lura DeBay, where she likes what the assessor is saying, would say, oh, but this assessor, I'll follow his or her uh, views and their, uh, I think she's actually very much influenced by mental health professionals, uh, as we all are in these kinds of cases. One of the dimensions of the best interest of the child test is that it is not static, that the courts, while they've been using the best interest of the child formulation, they have changed their views about all kinds of issues. And I give a few examples in the paper. One is on the issue of sexual orientation. At one time, judges were saying, well, it's usually not in the best interest of the child to be with a gay or lesbian parent. More recently, we've had the values of judges have changed. We have a different attitude towards sexual orientation. We have much more mental health information now. People have done research and said, well, children who go up with lesbian mothers or gay fathers don't seem to be any different from no better or worse than other contexts. Maybe we shouldn't take account of sexual orientation in the way that we did in the past. And there are relatively few recent examples of judges consciously saying, this is a lesbian parent. I don't think she should have custody or access for that uh, reason. On the other side of change, we see spousal abuse. If one looks back historically, and now historically into the 70s and 80s, there were very few decisions that considered uh, spousal abuse as a best interest factor. Now we see judges saying, well, there's research about best interests of the child, how it's affected by domestic violence. We should take account 
of this factor. So we've seen the, the best interest of the child has, uh, has changed. The formula is the same, but the application of it has continued to change. Uh, another example of change is in regard to, I think, joint custody. Um, in the late 70s, uh, after the concept of joint custody began to develop, um, we had the Ontario Court of Appeal and its two decisions, Baker and Kruger, suggest that uh, joint custody should rarely, if ever, be imposed on uh, uh, unwilling parents. More recently, I think the courts in Ontario have begun to say that uh, we recognize that it is, in general, uh, of value to have both parents involved in their children's lives. In some cases, and I don't want to say by any means in all cases, the courts are willing to impose joint custody on parents in a way that 20 years ago, I think, they might not have been willing to do. In other cases, they say, well, joint custody is not appropriate. Um, and I should say that the, the literature suggests that now over one quarter of all divorces, there is some form of joint custody, usually, of course, arrived at voluntarily, but sometimes judicially imposed. In other cases, we see judges saying, well, if it's not going to be joint custody, maybe the custodial parent has an obligation to consult with the non-custodial parent about decision making, so some form of involvement. In other cases, uh, we see judges setting up parallel parenting, so judges being more involved and saying, well, this is a high conflict case, uh, and I, I don't know that you can have joint custody, but there must be some form of uh, uh, shared parenting that you can have. Um, certainly, uh, we have um, continuing problems with the application of best interests. I want to talk just very briefly about uh, the issue of access and the application of the best interest child in the context of access is what I call a best interest paradox. And in this context, um, there is, I think, a very strong presumption that access will occur. It doesn't mean it should occur in all cases. Um, and indeed, one of the problems with the best interest of the child test is that the courts are a very blunt instrument for making difficult uh, social and human decisions, and they're even a blunter instrument for actually supervising ongoing relations between human beings, in particular, uh, in regard to the context of access. One of the things we know is that, in general, and we saw this on the videotape, children do better if they have access and continuing contact with both parents. That's true in general. There are certainly some cases where parents should not have access. One of the problems we know is that, in fact, the biggest access problem that we have in this country is that often the non-custodial parent doesn't want to visit, and there's nothing the law can do about that. The legal system focuses on those cases where we say, well, one parent wants to have access and they're not um, receiving access. Can the legal system force uh, access to occur? How should the legal system force access to occur? Um, the problem then that the courts have is in defining and enforcing access rights. And the, the best interest paradox is that while in general it's important to encourage both parents to allow access to occur, if you actually have to get in front of a judge and the judge says, okay, let's get the police in here and we'll enforce this access right, as they have to in some cases, it may not be in the best interest of these specific children. And I discussed, and there's a, a, a large body of case law here, but um, Macmillan and Macmillan, um, where uh, the judge is, is forced to say um, that it was a contempt application and the mother was saying, don't send me to jail even though I've been consistently thwarting this kind of access orders. It's not in my child's best interest to send me to jail and furthermore, it's going to harm my relation, the child's relationship with the father if, uh, access, if, I, if I go to jail and the judge says, well, I'm going to send you to jail anyway. That's the only way we're going to have access uh, occurring. Now, that's a, a sort of a paradoxical decision. It may not have been in the best interest of these specific children, but it's in the best interest of children in general, says the judge, so we're going to have uh, access uh, ordered in that kind of context. In many of these cases, and access is probably the best example of it, uh, the courts are not the best forum. As much as possible, we'd like to push people to uh, mediate and resolve their disputes rather than having judges try to impose solutions. When we're thinking about best interest of the child, one of the focuses that we're having today is how to reform the best interest of the child test. Should we reform it? And uh, although I write about it in the paper, I won't uh, talk much about that except to say um, that while the best interest of the child test is elusive and in many ways problematic, we're probably not going to move away from it. It's a very powerful uh, concept. Um, when people in this country have said, what about a different concept? 
Some Americans have said, really, it's not the best interest of the child. Once the parents are getting a divorce, it is what is the least detrimental alternative. And that may be a, an intellectually valid exercise. Um, I think it's politically very problematic. Symbolically, it's very problematic. We like the best interest rhetoric. So while we're looking at the House of Commons Committee and the, the reports that we'll be looking at in Canada, we have many uh, proposals to change who makes best interest decisions, how best interest decisions are made, but we don't have people saying, let's get rid of this concept. Rather, we say that there has to continue to be uh, a, a set of processes involving parents, assessors, mediators, lawyers, and judges in deciding what is in the best interest of children. And I think we're going to continue to have to wrestle with that as we move into the new um, century. Now, I want to thank you for your attention, and I'll turn back to the... Thanks, Nick. Uh, a number of the concepts that uh, Nick discussed today will be explored throughout uh, the day today. What do you want to move? Move As we, uh, as we planned the program, one of the, uh, the themes that we wanted to explore today was uh, what do we really know about uh, best interests uh, of the children? And particularly, what do we as lawyers need to know about the best interests of children? And Rhonda Friedman, who's uh, back again to, uh, to speak about parenting plans, uh, has written a paper which I've been fortunate enough to read and which I would suggest to everyone here is uh, and should be required reading for every family law lawyer and indeed any judge hearing a, uh, a case involving children. So having said that, Rhonda will uh, now present her paper. and I'm delighted to, um, uh, to be here to talk um, a little bit more from uh, the children's point of view and I really want to follow along from, um, from the children in the film and that's why I'm starting with a quote from uh, LNH uh, 12 that's up on the first overhead. Um, the paper was, um, I actually I met with the organizing committee earlier uh, When I met with the organizing committee um, last fall, I said it was an impossible task uh, for half an hour, that it was probably a year-long university course. Uh, so like Nick, I'm, um, not, it's not possible to, um, to cover all the things in the paper. Uh, but what I will do this morning is just highlight some of the issues that the organizers thought were important uh, and that certainly at Families and Transition we feel are important. Uh, what I won't be doing is talking a lot about the developmental responses that children have, although I think it's a particularly important context uh, for working with families who are divorcing, but I would draw your attention to the tables in Appendix 1. Uh, the other thing I'll say by way of beginning is that in view of the time, I'm not going to talk a lot about special considerations such as high conflict or sexual abuse allegations. Uh, I think they uh, warrant um, particular, uh, particularly different responses, uh, but there is a section in the paper on that uh, as well. Um, what I do want to say is when we showed the film that you, you saw earlier this morning um, in Ottawa, um, Senator Cohen um, immediately after the film said, we must listen to these children. And I hope that that's the context in which you will hear uh, the comments that I'm making. Can I have the next overhead, please? 
Uh, so in order to begin, I wanted to look at what is healthy child development, because what is it we're trying to do when we're working with divorcing families? Uh, and we believe that it involves responsible, consistent, and appropriate care uh, within a safe and stimulating and supportive environment. The problem for divorcing families in our experience is that divorce interferes with all of those things and makes it very difficult uh, for parents to provide them. There's a lot of debate in the literature, and I have um, numerous references uh, in the paper. Uh, if you want uh, background about the impact of divorce on children. Um, and there's a lot of debate about the long-term consequences of divorce, and certainly it's an issue that parents ask us a lot, will my children be ruined for life? Uh, and what I have to say is, depending who you read, it's the glass is either half empty or half full. Um, and certainly the half empty uh, school is probably best represented by the work of Judy Wallerstein and the half full uh, Mavis Hetherington. Uh, my own feeling is there'll be a sizable minority of children for whom divorce represents a risk factor. And I think our work, and I mean us collectively in this room, is around minimizing that risk for children. And in fact, I don't see it as the legal event of divorce, and, and in the paper I use the term separation and divorce interchangeably. Because from a child's point of view, the real issue is my parents no longer live together. And it's the various stresses uh, that the, uh, the shift in the living arrangements and the parents' uh, marital, marital situation brings that really create the problems for children. We have the next overhead. Um, if I had to give you uh, a very brief summary of three decades of divorce literature uh, in the next five sentences, it would be the six points on the overhead, and I'll speak uh, briefly about each of them. Uh, as I mentioned when I introduced the film, each of those children talked to us about parent conflict. And I was interested um, in Nick's remarks earlier this morning that he also raised the issue of conflict. And certainly that's very prevalent in the literature. Uh, but I think it might be helpful to talk for a few minutes about why conflict is so, um, so much of a risk factor for children, uh, especially in the context of parenting plans, which is what we're talking about today. Um, and for me, the issue is that conflict frightens children, and especially with the younger children, while they can imagine it getting worse, uh, getting better, they can also imagine it getting worse. Um, also, conflict um, in many families can become a safety issue. Uh, even for families where there has been no history of violence, the risk of, of violence goes up by 30 percent uh, at the time of separation. Um, and children um, are smaller, uh, they don't have power, and they can easily get in the way uh, and become hurt. And the thing, um, it also it affects parenting. Um, Judy Wallerstein talks about the diminished capacity to parent. And we feel that when parents are in, involved and embroiled in conflict, uh, they have less available to give their children, they're less able to concentrate on their children's needs. Um, and usually the thing that I like to end off with when I talk about uh, conflict with parents is, above all else, it's a very inappropriate role model for your children. If we all um, talk to our kids about solving problems and discussing things and working things out, um, it's not um, the example that we would be setting. The second theme that's certainly prevalent in the literature is that of parenting capacity. Um, and as I mentioned, Wallerstein talks about the diminished capacity to parent, and I think that that really stems from parents not resolving their own separated, relation, uh, separated issues. Um, so if there's grieving that hasn't been dealt with, if there are power and control or anger issues, those will always affect the parenting capacity. And for some parents, they need to acquire parenting skills that they may not be um, approaching divorce having. In some families, um, responsibilities get divided up, so it may well be that I was the person who did most of the disciplining and, uh, and maybe you weren't. And so if you're going to have um, the children for some or a major portion of time, those are skills you need to acquire. And certainly the dynamics change. It's very different for anyone in this room who is in this situation, I'm sure can attest to it, uh, that parenting alone is very different than parenting together. 
The third theme in the literature is the quality of the parent-child relationship. Um, and again, I think that Nick made some comments about this, and so I just want to emphasize that in almost all situations, children benefit from the freedom to develop and maintain uh, relationships with both parents in the post-divorce family. Uh, and I will echo Nick's comments that, of course, there are a few situations, and I'm thinking about serious substance abuse, substance abuse issues or psychiatric difficulties where that may be inadvisable, but we have other remedies like supervised access and um, some creative uh, alternatives that can sometimes allow children to continue that. As difficult as it may be, and I always think about the mother who once said to me, you know, it would have been so much easier if he just died, then I wouldn't have had to look at him every other Saturday when he comes to pick the children up. But from the child's point of view, it's not dissimilar to kids who were adopted at a very young age. Uh, and when they hit their teens, and we hear a lot about this now, that they often yearn and search um, for their biological parents. Um, and that's certainly the case that we see um, in our office. I, I think back to a child that I worked with some years ago whose father left when he was 18 months old, and he had not seen this father. And I met him when he was 10 and a half. Um, and the family was originally from Ottawa, so at Christmas they would go back to visit the grandparents. And when I saw him after Christmas, I asked, how was your holiday and what did you do? And he said, I stood on the street corner. Um, and it was a very cold winter. It was probably 20 below. And I asked him why he, he did that. And he said, um, in case my father drove by so I could wave at him. So this was a child 10 and a half years later, by the time I knew him, who was still desperate to know um, his biological father. Um, I won't say a lot about economic resources, there's certainly a lot in the literature, except to say in the two years that we've had the child support guidelines, we are increasingly aware of children's residential schedules that come out on the table, um, and when we add up the time in each home, it certainly, uh, the proposal seems to us to be formulated on the basis of meeting the 40% criteria uh, required by the guidelines. Um, and so that's just a cautionary note that doesn't feel to me like it's particularly in children's best interest. Uh, certainly routines and consistency is another thing that we see in the literature, uh, and I'll leave you to read more about that in the interest of time, but I did want to make a comment about support systems. Um, and I think it's really critical not only that people develop them after divorce, but they are encouraged to use them. Uh, and all of us in this room can be considered support systems to, uh, to families. And there are two comments I want to make about that. One is to echo the work of Janet Johnson, who primarily works with high-conflict families and who talked about what she labeled the cheerleaders of divorce and how those of us who are working particularly with one side or the other can actually aid and abet, if you like, um, that side, and that certainly is not in children's best interest. We have a case in our office now that we were discussing at a team meeting last week, and we decided that, in fact, the parents could probably be helped to settle fairly, fairly quickly, uh, but the lawyers weren't ready to give up the fight, and so our focus will be on how do we help them to give it up, because, of course, the parents can um, and that's what Janet talks about as being cheerleaders in divorce. Um, and certainly the other issue that comes up is how do we keep our personal biases out? Um, those of us who have decision-making power or a lot of influence with parents, um, I remember when our staff was being trained in mediation, we came down to the court and met with one of the, the masters at the time. And he said, um, so I won't say who told us this, but he said, I'm telling you this in the privacy of my office. I won't be quoted on it. But he said, I'm human. If I have a hard time getting to work, if the subway shuts down, if I've had a fight with my wife, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all of that's going to affect what happens uh, for the parents who come before me uh, during the day. And I think we really need to, um, to guard against that. Uh, we are human, but we are also there um, to advance uh, children's issues uh, with these families. Yes, um, I'm going to spend the rest of my time this morning talking about the uh, parenting plans because we believe that this approach is certainly, for most families, a better way to resolve um, post-divorce um, issues and uh, plan appropriately for children. 
Uh, and the first thing I want to say is, um, well, I almost refused to do this paper because it sounded to me like the organizing committee wanted a recipe for um, what I called um, residential schedules for children. I think that they originally thought of it as the parenting plan, um, but certainly I see, um, and at Families in Transition, we see parenting plans as much more than a residential schedule. Um, and so I thought I'd start by talking a little bit about what we, what the goal of this is. And it's not just the piece of paper that people walk out of our office with. I feel it's the whole process that we are working through with people. Um, certainly the goal is to have a piece of paper, but it's really to create a different environment in the family that allows them to parent effectively after divorce. Um, so I've got the goals up on the overhead. Maybe. Yeah, well, we'll move up. Um, firstly, in terms of a stable and nurturing environment, uh, for me, one of the most critical things is to shift this discussion from labels such as custody and access, so they're not words that you'll particularly hear in our office. Uh, I've been called um, when I go to Ottawa for meetings, because um, I'm on a lot of committees uh, up there, I've been called the language police. Um, we have really shifted over the years, and probably 20 years ago we did use those words, and we've used a number of things <laughs> since then. And in the past year, I'm using what, with parents what I call the language of parenting. Uh, and we just avoid adjectives, period. And you know what? It's a lot easier to help people settle and to have agreements that are respectful of children uh, and that make sense to people. They're less complicated. Uh, and so when I get um, parents walking in our office who say things like, I need my three days with, um, with Johnny or Susie, um, we ask them to put those labels, um, you know, and I want joint custody, we ask them to put those aside um, and stick with us, and if they still feel that they need them at the end of the day, we'll have another look at it. And I have yet to have a parent say to me, I've got to have that. Uh, because we're asking them to bring their kids into the room the way we did with the film and to put the children front and center. Um, so I suppose if I had one important recommend, re recommendation to make this morning, it would be to ask you to think about the language that you are using with your clients that we use in the courtroom and certainly the language that we are putting in our agreements. And I think the Minister of Justice uh, in her response to the Special Joint Committee has indicated that she um, is looking to change the language in the legislation as well. Um, a second way that we like to use parenting plans is to reflect the strengths of each parent. So rather than focus on um, all the transgressions in the marriage and in parenting leading up to this time, we want to help pe people figure out what it is they have to offer to their children and somehow incorporate that in the plan. Um, thirdly, uh, children's developmental needs. Um, most people are quite taken aback when we say to them, do you understand that we will make this agreement now and it will change? I like to tell people that right at the beginning because they get very upset if two or three years down the road um, they suddenly discover they have to get back to the table. So if they know it's coming, that's really important. Another thing that we like to alert parents to is the idea that it is not atypical. Um, if you have a younger ch child, that when they hit adolescence or pre-adolescence, the children themselves may ask to switch um, the residential arrangements. And that can be very devastating for someone, especially if they've primarily had the children living with them. Uh, so just knowing that it's not something that they did wrong, that it's something that might well happen and, and that kids sometimes need time at that age with the other parent uh, can also help them. Um, I feel that in parenting plan discussions, it's an opportunity to help protect children's attachments. And by that I mean not only to both parents, but to peers and extended family and people in their community. Um, and probably um, next to language, most important, it's an opportunity to start building this cooperative co-parenting relationship. And by co-parenting, I'm not talking about the 50-50 that a lot of people interpreted the Special Joint Committee's recommendations to mean. I'm talking about parenting after divorce, no matter where the child lives or how much time they spend in each home. Um, 
by separating, parents are usually making a statement that they don't know how to work together, they haven't been able to work it out as a couple, and yet we are expecting them to work it out as a parenting partnership. And I think we have an obligation to teach them how to do that and make sure that they leave our offices with the skills to do that. Um, we need to find ways to encourage cooperation, to acknowledge the importance of both parents and the children's lives, um, and to give them some problem-solving skills. Uh, the way that we do that is that we have a framework and in the past six months we have been making mandatory uh, for anyone who wants to mediate in our office um, a, a parent education program that has been a two-hour seminar and on the recommendation of people who are in it is going to move after Christmas to being a three-hour seminar. And what we do is give people some of the skills for creating a parenting plan. We don't assume that they'll just know how. It's probably, uh, divorce is probably a new experience for them as well. Um, and so we tell them, because you already know about uh, families in transition, that we start with kids. What we say is start with your kids. And in the paper, I have a whole series of questions. Uh, so we don't start with what's your proposal about with where these children should live. In fact, that's the very last thing we'll get to. Um, we ask them, um, who do you think your kids are? Um, and very important, what do you think they need and how might that be different from what you yourselves as an adult uh, in the situation or as a parent needs? So one of the biggest difficulties I see is that what gets advanced as a proposal often becomes a reflection of what the parent needs and doesn't re reflect at all what children need or um, their best interests. We ask them to think about how flexible their kids are. Um, are these children able to handle change? Um, and what's happening in their lives and what do we expect to happen in the next six months, in the next year, and so on and so forth. We ask them to reflect on how involved in parent business um, or in parent conflict uh, their children are. All of this is pretty essential data, I believe, in terms of deciding what the plan should be. And it really helps, again, to shift this focus from what parents want uh, and the labels that they'll walk into our offices with. Um, it shifts it back to what these children need. And as little Thomas said at the end of the film, um, uh, to think about what kids and what adults need. We also have a whole series of questions about parents that we'll give them. Uh, so things like, how committed are you to making your plan work? Um, how, how able are you to tolerate um, ambiguity? Uh, some people come to us with agreements that just say reasonable access and then usually say, um, and my most famous example is someone who called me from um, the hallway uh, when the court was across the road saying, and, and actually read me what the order said and said, what does that mean? What do I have to do? Um, and so I don't think that that's really helpful to children or parents to keep it very uh, loose and vague. And we also say to them, how will you work together as parents? Um, so, and you can read more about the questions in the paper, uh, but what we do is ask people to take this home, um, uh, sort of like a take-home exam at school, and make notes, because this is the data that they will bring to the table to help work towards solutions that will be in their children's best interest. Um, I want to move now to the next slide. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the principles behind the plan parenting plans that we do. And we tell people, whatever plan you come up with, um, you need to support this plan. In order to make it work, here are some of the things you need to consider. Um, so we suggest to them that there be some agreement um, about what you will tell children about the divorce, um, and that it be at an age appropriate level, and when you will tell them. There's nothing worse for children than hearing something from one parent and the other parent flying into a rage, uh, something like, he wasn't supposed to tell you that now. Um, and so it's really helpful if they can come to some understanding ahead of time about that. Uh, I have stopped discussing with people all the um, little details about how they're going to discipline their kids because over um, 25 years of practice I've learned that that's a no-win discussion. 
so what I tell people is um, you will be helping your kids if you can come up with values and guidelines for discipline. Uh, and one of our jobs, I think, is to help parents understand that they cannot control what happens in the other household. So setting out all kinds of rules about how it should be in both homes uh, isn't, doesn't seem to me that it's a very good use of time. Uh, so I like to focus on things like safety, on health and well-being, um, and help people to just leave it be um, in terms of what happens in the other home. Uh, thirdly on this list is protect children from conflict because I've already talked about how that, I don't know if I said it like this um, this morning, but certainly I do in the paper, that it's probably the best predictor of poor child adjustment. Uh, and so we want to put some meat on that for parents. So it's things like uh, refraining from criticizing what happens um, in the other home. Uh, you might want to listen. Children should feel free to talk about what happened um, in the three days or the weekend or whatever it is that they were with their other parent. Uh, but if you, I mean, I was brought up with the, the saying, if you can't say anything nice, don't say it. And I think it works well in this situation as well. And another sort of sort of watch point in terms of conflict would be transferring between homes, that they're often the biggest source of conflict for children. I mean, if you're separated, when do you see your former partner? Typically when the children um, are changing between homes. And one of the things that I guess in the last six or eight months in our office that we've been doing is um, switching a lot of the agreements so that the transfer occurs um, through school. Um, so that instead of having a child come back Sunday night and, um, and be rangy before bed, and I have friends who are teachers who will say, on Friday afternoon and Monday morning, they can always tell which children come from single parent families. Um, so we find that it, it can be a lot more effective, especially in a high conflict family, to have these children um, be returned on Monday right to school and then go Monday afternoon uh, to the other parent's home. And another principle that I think is really important is allowing children to remain children. Um, loyalty conflicts, um, if you read the literature about impact of divorce on children, uh, are something that are very serious for kids, um, especially with school-aged children. It's very easy because of their, where they're at developmentally to take sides between parents. Uh, and if there are loyalty conflicts that are not addressed, um, if I feel that I have to take care of one of my parents, if I'm very worried about them, it's going to be impossible for me to move on in terms of adjusting to and accepting the separation and whatever changes that brings. Um, there is the burden of adult business. I feel, parents often ask me, how much say should children have in the arrangements? And they usually mean the residential schedule. And I firmly believe that that's an adult decision. Um, kids have said to me very clearly, that there's another film that we did with W5 for CTV, um, where one of the kids says, I feel really sorry for children who are forced to choose. I think it's a terrible position to put children in. Um, and, and that's what I think of as the burden of adult business. I also don't like to see children worry so much about one parent um, that they are distracted from their normal developmental achievements. Uh, and I have yet to meet a child who doesn't tell me that as a result of divorce, they don't have more chores and responsibilities. I'm sure that that's true, uh, but parenting plans need to address to the extent that they can um, uh, inappropriate responsibilities or what in jargon terms is often referred to as a parentified child. Uh, in the paper I have um, a protocol for how we're doing parenting plans now and how much time do I have left? As much time as you need. Oh, I'm going to take the rest of the day. But <laughs> Um, so, uh, just in the interest of time, because we have a, a very exciting program ahead of us, I'm just going to highlight a couple of areas because you can read about the, the protocol in the paper. But we have found that having a preamble, which is often absent um, in a lot of agreements that I see, very helpful. And this is just a short paragraph uh, that really talks about who these parents are and affirms the importance of both of them in their children's lives. 
Um, then we move to the statement of decisions and responsibilities, and this is the typical kinds of things that you would um, be working out, things like uh, residence and health and education and so on. And I just want to suggest to you, um, in case this doesn't come up, uh, that you also think about, because parents often forget, Mother's Day, Father's Day, Mother's Birthday, Father's Birthday, and Child's Birthday. Um, it, people often get stuck on the fact if it's my weekend and it's Mother's Day, tough, like that's when the child's with me. But if we're truly making decisions in children's best interest, I believe we need to work those things out. Uh, more recently, and after some communication with the Minister of Health, we are also making provisions about children's health cards and agreements that we do. Uh, I haven't found that it's very useful to have the health cards go back and forth because either they'll get lost or we've had situations where one parent says, by the way, I'm not returning the card as a way of exacerbating the conflict. Um, and so we inquired with the um, Attorney General and the Ministry of Health about two cards, which for purposes, as you can imagine, of preventing fraud, they weren't keen on. Uh, but what they did tell us was there is actually a process that doesn't get talked about a lot, where parents can get a form from the Ministry of Health and fill that out. So we are um, providing that to people and telling them to get a Xerox of the health card and attaching that to the parenting plan, and each parent can have that. Uh, we also find it useful to talk about, um, we don't need to talk about birth certificates because each parent can leg legally obtain that um, in Ontario, but we do talk about passports um, because if the child doesn't have one or does have one, that can get to be a serious issue. Um, the other two things that, well, three things, I suppose, that may make some of the agreements that we do a little bit different, and I'd like to draw your attention to, reflect really those variables that I've already discussed um, about mediating child adjustment. So the whole way of we approach it is, what have we learned about kids from our practice and from our research, and how can we make, therefore, agreements that utilize that? And I think these last three bullets on the slide are particularly important. So one is, um, we don't do an agreement that doesn't have a conflict resolution clause. I can't reasonably predict um, things that um, will come up for people in the post-divorce family. I tell them that um, you're human, I expect there will be difficulties. The best I can do is give you ways to resolve those difficulties when they do occur. Um, and so we will actually have a whole clause in there that says um, in a little bit more articulate language, the last thing I will do is go to court and I'm going to do all these other things before. Uh, and I, I think that we're remiss if we don't have those sorts of guidelines in there. Um, one of the, a good example I can give you is a, a new agreement that we were doing in our office um, and we started in June. And the only piece that we had the opportunity to do before um, the parents and the mediator went on vacation was just the part about the summer, which was important for obvious reasons. And wouldn't you know it, but the first day um, the uh, person in my office who had done the agreement was on holiday, uh, and the um, parenting plan hadn't yet been typed up and sent out. Um, one of the parents called, and as the supervisor, the call got passed to me. Uh, and this mom said to me, um, we're already in trouble. This mediation stuff doesn't work. Um, I thought what we agreed to was, and she told me, and dad says it's this, and she said his arrangement. Um, and all we had to do in this case was read out that piece of the plan. Um, and she was really happy and said, oh, okay. End of call, no problem. Um, we didn't, uh, they didn't need to resort to um, getting lawyers involved in court and so on and so forth. And the child had a very successful summer. So someone said to me recently, but don't you think, you know, a lot of energy goes into making these parenting plans and then people just put them in the drawer and forget about them? And you know what, that's probably true, but the process to do it is important because as I'm telling you, it, it teaches problem solving. And because in instances like this mom calling us, um, she, I would have said to her, just pull it out of your drawer and, and read it. In this case, it was in our secretary's typing drawer um, and that's all we had to do. 
The, another thing that we find is really important is to have a clause about communication and the co-parental relationship. How are you going to communicate and what is this relationship going to look like? So for the mom who says to me, I wish he'd just died, I have to tell her, well he didn't and he's here and you're going to see him and so let's talk about what you want that to look like because I believe you have some power and control over that. Um, increasingly, we are also inserting into this piece of the agreement um, principles for shaping how people will get along. And I think technology is in our favor here. Uh, so for some people, emails, faxes, voicemail, you know, all of that sort of thing uh, can be very useful. But the piece that we really concentrate on is you can't co-parent effectively. And you might as well, um, you know, I, lo I love it in the film, I think it's the wisdom of children when, um, when Sandra says to, her, uh, to, to us, um, if parents are going to keep fighting, like why do they need to separate? Um, so we, <laughs> at, at nine years of age, it was about two weeks after her birthday when she said it. Um, and I usually repeat that to parents and say, so it's one of the benefits of separation. You can give up the fight. Uh, and we need to talk about how you will build trust and respect. Because I think that without the trust and respect, you can't have an effective co-parenting relationship. And then why don't you just get back together? It's a lot cheaper. Um, and the last thing that I would um, suggest to you is really important is monitoring and review. Uh, we spend a lot of our time saying, especially if you have really young kids, your agreement will need to change over time to reflect the changing developmental needs of children, and I've reviewed um, those for you in the paper. Uh, so we like to have something in there that says, We'll meet uh, annually, biannually. It really depends on the age of the children. The younger, um, then I really like annually. If it's a higher conflict family, you know, if we have low conflict, high conflict on a spectrum, the more you move up, the more often we might want to meet with them, especially in the first year, 18 months of the agreement. Uh, and I want to get them into the habit of doing this. We tell people that you're going to have a business partnership. So all, that, all those courses you had to go to at work about strategic planning and how to communicate, here's where you can actually use them. So you come to a meeting, you have um, notes, and uh, do it around a table, um, and look at what difference this will make to your children. I will make a few comments about residential schedule because as I, okay, um, and I'll, I'll make them quickly as per my instructions. Um, I, as I said, I was very reluctant to do this paper because I don't believe in formulas. I don't think they're respectful of children. Uh, I think that they have an absence of creativity that reflects the kinds of needs I've talked about uh, in the paper. And I was very concerned, so I'll put this out on the table, uh, that people would grab onto a framework and say, right, that's what she said works for three-year-olds or that's what five-year-olds need. Um, and we don't show these frameworks particularly to parents. Um, we start, as I say, with the questions that I mentioned. Um, so formulas, and I've given you the 10 that I was able to find in the literature, um, they don't involve creativity. Um, and I, I think that um, what the literature is clearly saying at the moment is, uh, that frequency of contact uh, is much less important than high quality regular time um, with um, both parents. And the other issue that the recipes don't deal with is abandonment. And Nick mentioned this as well. And for my money, it's a far more serious issue for children. Um, we are seeing probably between 20 and 30% of children. And Wallerstein said at the five-year mark in her study, 50% of, of uh, dads, because she had mother-led families, had disappeared from their children's lives. And I think that's a lot more serious. And I hope that the parenting plan uh, process allows us to um, uh, find a way to uh, deal with the grief issues and uh, some of the c power and control issues that I think help uh, one parent to disappear so that they can remain important to their children. Another reason I don't like recipes is um, that I don't think that, and you'll see from the frameworks, there's no agreement about what makes sense particularly, especially at the younger ages. So one of the frequently asked questions about should preschoolers have overnights, you're going to see 10 different answers in those frameworks. 
Um, what is really important, because I think it's more helpful to talk about what kids need, is that children in my, uh, for my money need a secure home base, especially for the younger children, that we can maybe be a little more creative around some of the transferring and the number of transfers um, when there are siblings, because siblings are a protective factor for children that the number of shifts have to reflect the child's personality and temperament uh, so that our best example is a, a parents who uh, probably were wonderful candidates for shared parenting but the child wasn't uh, and so he just simply could not manage the back and forth that the schedule imposed and with older children and I'm thinking of um, probably 12 and up, these children need to be involved, not to make the decision particularly, but their input is particularly important because for anybody in this room who has a teenager, um, if you've tried to make them do something that they don't want to do, um, they vote with their feet. Um, so I, I'm going to wind up. I won't talk about some of the difficulties because they're in the paper, but what I will do, if I can on my last slide. Um, is I want to end with a quote from Madam Justice Louise Arbour. She was really talking about Kosovo, but I think her words are very, very important um, and instructive, uh, and I have her permission to apply it to parenting plan issues. And she said when, uh, at her swearing-in ceremony uh, for the Supreme Court that it takes more courage to yield than to win, to endorse a result that may not seem perfect, but that is good. And I think that that's uh, really what we all need to communicate to parents. Uh, as you can tell, we're way behind. Not that that particularly concerns me. But uh, we'll have a quick uh, coffee break. Uh, when you go out, there's a, a handout which is a uh, one-page summary of Jeffrey Wilson's uh, talk this afternoon with Alex Seaton, which I would ask everybody to pick up. See you back here soon.